Today, we live in an age of mechanical marvels. But if we look back 2,000 years, we may be surprised by what we find. Fantastic machines were in common use in the ancient world, from war machines to automatic doors and even robotic theaters. The ancients even had a steam engine. Now, we reveal how the first age of machines was in fact in the ancient world. Now on Modern Marvels, Ancient Discoveries 3. centuries marveled at the world of the ancient Greeks. A world where the human mind was set free to look beyond the everyday drudgery of life and think of greater things. A time of science, art, and philosophy, dazzling new ideas that they would export to the rest of the world. And at the heart of this age of wonder, stood a great city. Not in Greece or Italy, but here on the coast of ancient Egypt, in a place called Alexandria. While the Romans thought of war and the Greeks thought of philosophy, in Alexandria they thought of thought itself. These halls once echoed to the footsteps of Plato, Aristotle, and Archimedes. But you might also have found another less well-known face here. He was not a philosopher or poet, but an inventor, and he almost started an industrial revolution 2,000 years ago. They called him Mechanos, the machine man, but we know him as Heron of Alexandria. 2,000 years before the modern day, Heron was building his own machine age and in the process creating devices that still amaze us today. Heron lived in Alexandria at a time when it was the most cosmopolitan city on earth. This beautiful city, once home to the legendary Queen Cleopatra, was the brains behind the classical world. Great minds from across the world were drawn here to trade in the most valuable of commodities, not gold or slaves or corn, but knowledge. The great library was the bank for this knowledge. Here were gathered together all the writings of the Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, and more. Halls piled to the ceiling with scrolls of mathematics, philosophy, geography, and history, all vying for space with plays, fables, songs, and poems. Today, hardly any of these works survive, and we can only dimly imagine what wonders once lay in Alexandria. But we do know that hidden in its vaults lay the plans for the most extraordinary machines ever created. The Great Library at Alexandria was, I think, the intellectual powerhouse of the ancient world. It was the largest and the best library in the Mediterranean. If you were looking for any particular book, there was always a good chance that you could read it at Alexandria. Attached to the Library at Alexandria was an institution called the Museum. Not a museum as we would imagine it, with objects on display in glass cases and cabinets. Museum was a place to muse, to think, to discuss, to invent. Many of the professors in the museum had written the greatest books in the library. Some devoted their energies to figuring out how the world worked, and some spent their time planning, devising and building inventions. It was here in the museum that Heron set about creating his extraordinary inventions. Today, none of his machines survive, and we know almost nothing about the man himself. But we do know about his marvelous machines, because Heron wrote books on how to build them, and incredibly, copies of some of those books survive. They open a window on the wonderful mechanized world he knew.
Stored in one of the modern world's great repositories of knowledge, Oxford University, it is still possible to find a copy of one of Heron's books. It is a rare document which gives a tantalizing glimpse of surprising ancient machines. Although the original is long lost, this 16th century copy can take us straight back into Heron's world. Within these pages, this master mechanic described his inventions and the sort of places you might find his robotic devices. Some were for the home, some simply there as entertainment for dinner parties. Others whirred and clanked away in theaters, producing amazing special effects. But the most likely place to find one of Heron's machines wasn't in either of those places. It was in the temples. Nowhere in the ancient world was more cosmopolitan than Alexandria, so nowhere had more religions all vying for attention. Today, Islam is the city's main religion, but 2,000 years ago, there were many, many more faiths to choose from. We have to think about in the ancient world that there was stiff competition between different cults, Roman cults, Greek cults, Egyptian cults, cults for political leaders and, and all sorts of mixes between these. So if you had something special that would attract attention, um, then that would give you an edge in, in, in the market to attract visitors to your temple. In other words, what priests of all these religions needed was magic. And that's just what Heron could provide with fantastic machines which would appear to move as if commanded by the gods. He would even create automatic temple doors, which would open and close when a sacrifice was given to the gods. Heron was using his talents as a magician and showman to trick the ancient worshippers into believing they had witnessed miracles happening in front of their very eyes. Heron is credited with inventing the steam engine during the first century AD, but the Greeks only used it as a novelty. Modern marvels will continue in a moment. One of Heron's most ingenious machines was his automatic temple doors. The idea was simple, but brilliant. As a priest and congregation approached their temple, the doors would magically open to welcome them inside. In front of the huge closed doors of the temple, the priest would theatrically step forward and light a fire on an altar by the doors. Beneath this altar, an amazing array of pipes, containers, and weights would then swing into play, unbeknown to the expectant congregation. Water flowed unseen into buckets that counterweighted the huge doors. Above ground, the priest might now make a final offering on the fire as the heat drove the hidden mechanism below. Then suddenly, as the counterweights filled, the doors slowly creaked open as if the gods were pleased with the sacrifice. A fantastic finale was provided by the sounding of a fanfare as the mechanism blew compressed air through a trumpet. To Heron, it was simply mechanics, but to the congregation, it was a miracle. There could have been few better ways to impress your audience. And there is evidence that even the great temple at Ephesus in Turkey, one of the wonders of the ancient world, may have been fitted with these automatic doors.
Steve Poole, a kinetic artist, is fascinated with the work of Heron and has built a scale model to show how the automatic doors actually worked. A cylinder of air is heated using fire. The air inside expands and travels through a tube into a container of water, in this case a red canister. The hot air pushes the water out of the canister and into another container which gradually fills. The mechanism uses a counterbalance, and when one container fills and drops, another rises, causing the doors to swing open. It is a simple machine, but an extremely effective one, and one which shows Heron had mastered the elemental forces of water, fire, and air. When the altar fire was extinguished, the air cooled and drew water back out of the container, so it rose and closed the doors. Heron invented many temple machines which included these automated moving figures, which made offerings to the temple fire when it was lit. Of course, it was one thing to persuade people to come into your temple, but quite another to persuade them to part with their money. And money was the key to running a successful religion. How to get people to spend it and how to collect it were just two of the problems Heron also had answers for. This is the first, a holy water dispenser. It was the world's first coin-operated slot machine. As people entered the temples, they were required to wash their hands using holy water that had been blessed by the priests. Blessing and selling holy water was time-consuming for the priests. So Heron invented a machine that made their lives easier and was more efficient. When a worshipper placed a drachma coin in the top, out came a precisely measured cup full of expensive but holy water. For the worshippers, it once more looked like a miracle. In reality, the dropping of the coin caused a lever to fall, opening a valve to let out water. For those who could see the inside, it was simply another mechanical marvel. But for the eager audience, it was pure magic. In solving the priest's problem of dispensing holy water, Heron had invented the coin-operated vending machine 1,800 years before its modern equivalent was first patented. Other miraculous machines may also have helped to bring in the worshippers, such as this replica in a major exhibition of ancient technology in Athens. This magical Greek device is a smart tap. As water is taken out with a cup, it automatically fills itself back to the right level. This type of simple miracle machine may well have provided the inspiration for Heron's water dispenser. It is hard to imagine today that these silent temple ruins may once have been filled with such magical machinery, performing what looked like miracles to an awestruck audience.
These were huge temples, some of the wealthiest and the most splendid in the ancient world. Heron's automatic inventions would have added further to the sheer sense of splendor and awe that any worshipper would have experienced. But Heron had one more money-making device for the temple priests. One which would allow worshippers to think they were talking with the gods, but which was in fact much more dishonest. This is the Omen Machine, the world's first great con job. Heron's most famous mathematical work is Proposition 1.8, which calculates the area of a triangle based on the lengths of its sides. Modern Marvels will continue in a moment. In the ancient world, one of the reasons for going to a temple was to find out what the future might hold. And ancient peoples were happy to pay for a glimpse of things to come. For this, they would consult Heron of Alexandria's Omen Machine. Someone coming into the temple which was equipped with one of these devices would not, of course, see all the workings. As they walked into the gloom of the interior, they would see just this wheel and a mechanical bird. After paying a suitable fee, they could ask the god a simple yes or no question. Turn the wheel and the bird would either sing or not. The god had spoken. But of course it was not the gods who had made this bird sing, but Heron. Inside the mechanism, a series of cogs, ropes, and pulleys made the bird sing when the wheel was turned. A simple cog attached to the inside of the device could then be disengaged, perhaps by a priest, to silence the bird if the other answer was required. Singing gave one answer, not singing the other. The priest could choose which was most appropriate. It is the oldest mechanical confidence trick in the world. And the wonderful bird song? Just a cup attached to a warbling whistle being lowered into a tank of water. Sound was the key to many of Heron's inventions, from his omen machines to his elaborate windmill-powered musical organ. But getting it all to work together is much harder than it might seem. Richard Windley is an artist and musical instrument maker who has been inspired by Heron's machines, which incorporated sound movement within their design. Richard recreated a mechanical singing bird similar to the ones that once adorned the omen machine. It was an intriguing challenge to see if he could make Heron's bird sing. The drawings of Heron which I discovered and the writings which are sort of fairly descriptive but rather tantalizing give the basic outlines of how he managed to get these things working. This machine uses the siphon mechanism the same concept which flushes modern toilets. Water is poured into the top, and when it reaches a certain point, the siphon action sucks out water at high speed. This fast-flowing water pushes the air in the pipes and forces it upwards. It causes a warbling whistle to sing and opens and closes a valve, making the bird's beak move. This is a very simple version with just a single bird, but if we talk about sort of whole flocks of these things, perhaps six or eight or ten of these things all being driven by water pressure, then, you know, the effect would be, would be staggering, particularly to probably a public that were not technologically knowledgeable.
and Heron built far more elaborate machines than this. In this strange device, when you lift an apple from a pedestal, a figure of Hercules fires an arrow from a bow toward a dragon. One time when Heron's omen machines were in particular demand was during war, a frequent event in the ancient world. Everyone wanted to ask the gods if they or their loved ones would survive. But Heron could help with more than just omen machines. In Alexandria, he had read treatises by Archimedes, Tisibius, and Dionysius on building war machines. Perhaps he could devise machines that would not just predict the outcome of wars, but would actually help to win them. Heron turned his prodigious mechanical mind to the art of warfare. Heron had automated doors, fountains, and musical boxes. Now he wanted to automate war. Building on the theoretical work of the great Greek mathematicians, he described automatic war machines, stronger, faster, and more fearless than the foot soldiers of the day. A deadly military technology centuries ahead of its time. Alan Wilkins has been using ancient descriptions of war machines to try to rebuild these fearsome devices. This is a Greek catapult, but it is no ordinary weapon. This is the Polybolos, the multi-shooter. It's the first machine gun. And it's over 2,000 years before what is now regarded as the first machine gun, the Victorian Gatling gun. This ingenious weapon had many unique features. It was one of the first uses of a chain mechanism anywhere on Earth. It could fire a bolt further and harder than any man. And most terribly, it could fire bolt after relentless bolt without rest. The Roman army in particular had an interest in such lethal devices. With a huge border to defend, such weapons offered them a distinct advantage. From the Roman perspective, men like Heron could help to hold the empire together. Here on Trajan's column in Rome can be seen an automatic cherubalista, or hand catapult. This machine originated in Alexandria and dates from Heron's day. It may even have been devised by him. Alan Wilkins has built a working model. The device mimics the action of a traditional archer firing arrows, but with much more force. It is a primitive military robot. The main length of the machine represents the outstretched arm of the archer. A double-handed cranking system then draws the string back, clamped between two metal hooks. When the arm is fully stretched, these steel fingers then release, driving the bolt forward with terrific force. Alexandria, of course, received a tremendous boost. By Heron's day, it was, a, of course, a Roman province, and the Romans obviously backed this research there. They continued to want to use engineers like Heron because they knew they were the best. Many devastating war machines would have been used in battle, but others were developed as prototypes for future use. Here are these Alexandrian engineers thinking up all these ideas which are a couple of thousand years before they can ever be realized. Uh, they didn't allow the limitations of their own technology to limit their ideas. But Heron had more to offer the Alexandrians than just siege engines and miracle machines. He 
He wanted to entertain them. And to do that, he chose a place where anything could happen. The theater. Hera describes almost 100 machines and toys in his surviving work, Pneumatica, including a fire engine and a wind organ. Modern Marvels will continue in a moment. It was in the indulgent world of the theatrical arena that Hera knew his genius at creating magical machines could truly be recognized. In ancient times, theater was at the center of many people's lives. It was here that people could join together and discover new ideas and experiences. Theaters such as this vast one at Epidaurus still stand as a testament to their enduring popularity with the people of the classical world. This was as close as the ancients got to cinema, their very own field of dreams. Even the acoustics were precisely scientifically designed like a modern cinema's to heighten the audience's experience. Well, the classical world theater was of huge importance and had been for centuries. The audiences flocked in huge numbers to the theater, which in a sense was the, the form of mass communication of the day. There there were uh, elements of politics, culture, even religion played out before a mass audience. Of course, it was hugely attractive to Heron because he had a ready-made audience, an audience which was conditioned, habituated almost, one might say, to going to the theater and enjoying spectacle entertainments there. Heron knew he could add to this experience. The skills he had learned building war machines and temple illusions could finally be given free reign on a stage where anything was possible. He began by devising theatrical staging with the eerie ability to move on and off stage on its own. This is the first mechanical marvel Heron used to astound the theater audiences of ancient Alexandria. It was built using Heron's original descriptions. It demonstrates how gravity can be used to make a piece of scenery move on and off stage, apparently of its own will. It is the precursor of the modern computerized scenery we see in the West End of London and New York's Broadway today. Ο Ήρων έχει περιγράψει στα βιβλία του μηχανισμούς και αυτόματα που είναι η πιο ανεπτυγμένη τεχνολογία της εποχής του. Περιγράφει κλειστά αυτόματα συστήματα, συστήματα με ανάδραση και αυτόματα θέατρα που παρουσιάζουν ένα ολόκληρες θεατρικές παραστάσεις. A compartment in the top of the device contained sand and when it was released through a series of holes, it pulled down a weight. The weight was attached to a rope which was wound around an axle. When the rope unwound from the axle, the device moved forward. When fully unwound, a lever clicked, the weight was lifted, and the device trundled back again. Heron wrote a whole treatise about automatic theatres. The idea of the automatic theatre is that it can move by itself. Automaton in Greek actually means a self-mover. Heron is quite interested in making absolutely sure that you make it quite small so that the audience won't suspect that there's actually a person inside the theater running the show. A simple spindle with pegs which made all these movements possible was in fact one of Heron's greatest inventions. This carefully wound arrangement of pegs and ropes is what a modern computer scientist would call a program. No doubt the audiences at Alexandria's theaters marveled at these moving sets for a while. 
But as Hera knew, audiences are always looking for something new to grab their attention. He had automated the set, but what about the actors? This would be his next bold step, to create an entirely automatic theater production with automatic sets, actors, and effects that would run on its own for over 20 minutes. Heron decided to automate the classic Greek tale of tragedy and bloody revenge, Nopolis. The story tells of how King Nopolis seeks revenge after his son is killed by Ajax at the close of the Trojan Wars. The play begins with 12 characters repairing a warship, all moving automatically. Below the action, the mechanics all remain hidden inside the box. Leaving the audience is astounded and intrigued to see all these wooden characters moving in unison. To complete the illusion, Heron added sounds and special effects. Scenes changed and back cloths dropped automatically, providing a new background for each piece of the action in turn. To prevent collisions between characters, the action all took place on different planes, which rose and fell at different times during the performance. Powering the whole pageant was a system of weights and ropes, sand glasses and seed hoppers, utilizing gravity to provide the required energy. The complexity of so many choreographed automatic elements was an incredible feat of engineering and ingenuity. As the ship in the story encountered a storm, Heron used an automatic thunder machine to shake some fear into the audience. The goddess Athena appears on cue to command the weather as the story reaches its climax. She causes a bolt of lightning to hit Ajax, the enemy in the story. He dies, and our hero Nopolis finally has his revenge. As the final sounds rang out around the theater, the first time this play was performed, the audience must have been enraptured by the spectacle in front of them. Actually making the play happen was no less miraculous than the event the audience had just witnessed. It might not be magic, but it required a mathematical genius to make it work. Timing every element of the story correctly, calculating the exact weights for balances and counterbalances, the speed of the cogs and the order of the scenes would baffle many engineers today and was perhaps miraculous in itself. The engine which drove the whole show was this hopper. It harnessed the power of gravity and was filled with either sand or seeds. The slow release of these then started the chain of events. As the seeds fell, a weight on top of them lowered. That weight then pulled a rope, which then in turn turned a spindle. This spindle was effectively the master control. It held the program stored in a complex system of ropes wound around pegs which set off different aspects of the show when the rope was unwound past certain points. It triggered the individual pieces of the theater, such as this spindle, 
which revolved to make dolphins apparently leap through the waves. In Alexandrian theaters like this, crowds may once have gasped as roars of thunder and flashes of lightning emerged from the strange automatic theater on stage and reverberated around the auditorium. The theater in Alexander, I think, was at the center of the city's life. Also, and importantly, before the highly critical audience in the theater in Alexandria, reputations were won and lost. And it's in that highly competitive context that we should see Heron of Alexandria's spectacular stage devices. These were devices meant to wow the audience. It's difficult to recapture something of their impact, but I imagine that it was like watching the first talking movies at the beginning of the 20th century. Something that would make you want to come back to the theatre, something that would make you remember Heron of Alexandria as an inventor. Heron was an entertainer and a flamboyant inventor. While many of Heron's designs were intended to either impress worshippers in a temple or to entertain audiences in a theatre, some were mechanical toys or novelties built simply for amusement in the home. But one invention could have changed the world forever. It's a steam-powered engine, invented by Heron thousands of years before its time. Heron's work, Catoptrica, deals with his study of light and mirrors. In it, he states that vision results from light rays emitted by the eyes, and that these rays travel with infinite speed. Modern marvels will continue in a moment. Heron had discovered the power of fire, water, and air. And finally, he combined his knowledge to create steam power. This would lead to the invention of a simple but remarkable device. The strange machine is Heron's steam ball, the first steam turbine engine, and the fastest revolving mechanical instrument in the ancient world. Heron was just half a step away from inventing the steam engine. He knew the principles of steam power. He had designed a revolutionary device. What might have happened if he'd taken that extra half step? I'm heating up the, um, this container here so that it generates steam, there's water in here and the uh, steam will come up through these pipes into this ball and out through these jets and then it should spin. It was a sight to behold. Heron had managed to control the power of steam. It was a remarkable breakthrough. This device could perhaps have started an industrial revolution 2,000 years ago. Had Heron combined what he knew about pistons with this steam ball invention, he might have made a true steam engine. The invention of the steam engine in 1721 ushered in the Industrial Revolution, bringing in its wake mass production, high-speed travel, and the birth of the age of the consumer. The modern world was forged by the steam engine. But how would the world look today if that giant leap had been taken by Heron nearly 2,000 years earlier?
So why didn't Heron's greatest invention start a revolution? Perhaps he simply didn't make the connections and never saw this wonderful machine as anything more than a toy. Or more ominously, in a world run on cheap and plentiful slave power, perhaps no one saw the need for labor-saving devices. It's fascinating to speculate how the world might be different today if we hadn't forgotten Heron of Alexandria and his wonderful inventions, if they'd been embraced rather than rejected by medieval scholars. If the people who'd seen the wondrous steam ball had thought of it as more than an idle curiosity or just a children's plaything. After all, it's clear from his inventions that Heron of Alexandria knew about steam mechanics and knew the basis of computer programming. There's an interesting scholarly question, which is, you look at Heron's writings and, and those of his contemporaries, and we feel they were almost approaching technological liftoff. That in another generation or two with the steam engine and other inventions in the wake of that, we might almost have been facing an industrial revolution taking place 2,000 years before it actually occurred. We consider ourselves today at the cutting edge of technology but in many ways we are only just beginning to catch up with developments in the ancient world. Two thousand years ago, there was a world more familiar and more advanced than we could have imagined. A time when mechanical machines brought wonder and magic to ancient cities. A time that has been forgotten for centuries and is only now beginning to be revealed again. What ancient discoveries still await us and what others have been lost forever? Heron has given us just a glimpse of his amazing world. But what could our world have been like today if we had not forgotten Heron of Alexandria? art and philosophy, dazzling new ideas that they would export to the rest of the world. And at the heart of this age of wonder stood a great city. Not in Greece or Italy, but here on the coast of ancient Egypt, in a place called Alexandria. While the Romans thought of war and the Greeks thought of philosophy, in Alexandria, they thought of thought itself. These halls once echoed to the footsteps of Plato, Aristotle, and Archimedes. But you might also have found another less well-known face here. He was not a philosopher or poet, but an inventor, and he almost started an industrial revolution 2,000 years ago. They called him Mechanos, the machine man but we know him as Heron of Alexandria. 2,000 years before the modern day, Heron was building his own machine age and in the process creating devices. They open a window on the wonderful mechanized world he knew. Stored in one of the modern world's great repositories of knowledge, Oxford University, it is still possible to find a copy of one of Heron's books. It is a rare document which gives a tantalizing glimpse of surprising ancient machines. Although the original is long lost, this 16th century copy can take us straight back into Heron's world.
Within these pages, this master mechanic described his inventions and the sort of places you might find his robotic devices. Places that still amaze us today. Heron lived in Alexandria at a time when it was the most cosmopolitan city on Earth. This beautiful city, once home to the legendary Queen Cleopatra, was the brains behind the classical world. Great minds from across the world were drawn here to trade in the most valuable of commodities, not gold or slaves or corn, but knowledge. The Great Library was the bank for this knowledge. Here were gathered together all the writings of the Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, and more. Halls piled to the ceiling with scrolls of mathematics, philosophy, geography, and history, all vying for space with plays, fables, songs, and poems. Today, hardly any of these works survive, and we can only dimly imagine what wonders once lay in Alexandria. But we do know that hidden in its vaults lay the plans for the most extraordinary machines ever created. The Great Library at Alexandria was, I think, the intellectual power. Today, we live in an age of mechanical marvels. But if we look back 2,000 years, we may be surprised by what we find. Fantastic machines were in common use in the ancient world, from war machines to automatic doors and even robotic theaters. The ancients even had a steam engine. Now, we reveal how the first age of machines was in fact in the ancient world. Now on Modern Marvels, Ancient Discoveries 3. centuries marveled at the world of the ancient Greeks. A world where the human mind was set free to look beyond the everyday drudgery of life and think of greater things. A time of science. Our house of the ancient world. It was the largest and the best library in the Mediterranean. If you're looking for any particular book, there was always a good chance that you could read it at Alexandria. Attached to the library at Alexandria was an institution called the Museum. Not a museum as we would imagine it, with objects on display in glass cases and cabinets. Museum was a place to muse, to think, to discuss, to invent. Many of the professors in the museum had written the greatest books in the library. Some devoted their energies to figuring out how the world worked, and some spent their time planning, devising, and building inventions. It was here in the museum that Heron set about creating his extraordinary inventions. Today, none of his machines survive, and we know almost nothing about the man himself. But we do know about his marvelous machines, because Heron wrote books on how to build them, and incredibly, copies of some of those books survive. <laughs> 